This is the Huawei MateBook X Pro, and this is its cooling system. It's not very good. I'm going to show you why, and then we're going to modify it and make it better. Welcome to Brad's Hacks. Whether you prefer speed, quietness, or just the comfort of low temperatures, a competent cooling system is the key. For me personally, I like having the fastest computer in the most compact form factor. That's why I like to take an Ultrabook like this, improve its performance, and make it as fast as a much bigger laptop. Nowadays, mobile processors are extremely scalable. This i7-8565U can turbo boost to 4.1 GHz on all four cores, but under load, it can only do so in short bursts. By increasing the cooling capacity and removing power limits, we enable it to operate at a much higher frequency continuously even under heavy load. I was able to do this with last year's MateBook X Pro, and that resulted in a 30% performance increase in not only benchmarks, but also real-world applications like Photoshop. So the bottom line is, with software limits removed, the more cooling you give these chips, the more performance you'll get in return. Last year, I removed major bottlenecks such as VRM overheating by conducting heat away from those regions. This time, we're tackling how the heatsink is fundamentally designed. In most laptops, like this Lenovo right here, heat pipes transfer heat from the processor to a Finstack style heatsink. A centrifugal fan pushes air through the Finstack. Notice how the gush of smoke from my wind indicator very quickly goes through the heatsink and exits the laptop. The air coming in is cool and the Finstack is hot. So as the air flows across each fin, heat is transferred to the air, which exits the system. Therefore, you have a net transfer of heat out of the laptop. But you see, the MateBook X Pro doesn't have a fin stack. Instead, its heat sink is just this big plate with heat pipes running across. Heat spreads across the surface and it warms up the air inside the laptop. And all this fan is doing is just pulling that air out of the laptop. Let me show you. So I took my old MateBook X Pro's bottom cover and gave it a window so that we can analyze the airflow. There are three vents through which air can enter, so let's puff some smoke into each of these. So we see a few problems with this setup. First, not all of the air actually goes across the heatsink. Second, the airflow is pretty slow compared to especially the exhaust of the fan where most heatsinks would be located. Third, the airflow is very smooth. That means it's laminar flow instead of turbulent flow. You actually want more turbulence to have more heat transfer with the air. It's just not a very effective cooling system. As a result, the MateBook X Pro, despite its attractive specs on paper, is known to run hot, loud, and or slow. Now you might be wondering, okay, why doesn't the MateBook X Pro have a fin stack? Well, if you've heard anything about the MateBook X Pro, you've probably heard of its thin bezels and high screen to body ratio. Screen to body ratio. Screen to body ratio. The screen to body ratio. Screen to body ratio. Screen to body ratio. In order to slim down those bezels, Huawei had to move not only the webcam, but also the display controller and the antennas from the display assembly back into the main body of the laptop, thereby taking away valuable space from the cooling system. Huawei did make a few tweaks to the 2019 model that we have here, such as a bigger fan and perforations over the VRM area, but the overall heatsink design is the same, so there is still a lot of room for improvement. There might be a way we can reintroduce a fin stack into this laptop by moving one of the Wi-Fi antennas out of the way. But before we do that, we need to set a baseline for how the laptop currently performs so that we can have a good before and after comparison. Let me explain what we're doing here. As I alluded to earlier, there's a positive correlation between power and compute speed. Your chip takes a certain amount of energy to perform an operation, so if you want it to perform more operations per second, you're going to have to increase the power. But if your number of cores is fixed, the curve looks more like this, a square root style curve because of the relationships between frequency 
voltage, and power. That's why Intel has chosen to triple the number of cores over the past three years, going from two cores in Kaby Lake to six cores in Comet Lake for their 15 watt processors to get more efficient increases in compute speed. Because we're working with a particular chip for this project, we can't swap the chip out. All we can do is increase the power uh, and then increase the frequency because of that. Uh, to get more compute speed, we're going to be operating on this curve. Nevertheless, we're going to be able to increase the power by you know, improving the cooling system, thereby increasing our compute speed. There is also a positive correlation between power and processor temperature because if you give it more power, it's going to heat up more. But if you increase your cooling capacity and improve the cooling system, then you're going to be dropping this entire line down. So for any particular power level, let's say 15 watts, you're going to be able to have a drop in temperature. Or for any temperature, let's say 90 degrees, you're going to be able to sustain more power without overheating. So by increasing our cooling capacity, we're going to be either increasing our power or dropping the temperature. And we have the ability to choose which one we want. Depending on what your priorities are, you may want to see lower temperatures just for your own comfort of your fingers, or you want to have a faster computer. I'm going to choose this route, but I'm going to do tests for both of these. Have a controlled power and see how much the temperature drops, and have a controlled temperature and see how much the power increases. The ambient temperature is currently 24 degrees, and we're going to do our constant temperature test to see how much cooling capacity we have right now. So I'm going to turn the speed shift to favor maximum frequencies. We have our power limits basically disabled. And we're just going to run a Prime95 stress test. As you can see here, the temperature has shot up to 90 degrees. And it's staying there because of the throttling mechanism. The CPU is uh, modulating its frequency so that it never exceeds 90 degrees. So this is... Um, controlling this particular variable right there for us. All we have to watch for right now is the package power. So we're going to let this run for 10 minutes and check back and see where the package power stabilizes to. That's going to give us the equilibrium um, power that we can sustain. 10 minutes have passed. We see that the package power has stabilized to about 20 watts. And as a result, the frequency of the CPU has stabilized to between 2.3 and 2.4 gigahertz. So now we have our first data point, that one right there, 90 degrees and 20 watts. So all we gotta do is go ahead with the modifications and after that, uh, measure these two data points to see how much we've improved. Another test we're gonna do is running Cinebench repeatedly. Notebookcheck.com uses this test to see how various laptops' performance degrades as the cooling system becomes saturated. It's a great way to see how well the laptop will actually perform under the most demanding workloads. Keep in mind that this is already a slightly modified MateBook X Pro to begin with because I've upgraded the thermal paste and replaced the GPU thermal pad with a copper shim. I did those during a live stream on my channel the second day I got this laptop. I've also added graphite sheets and thermal pads between the keyboard and motherboard to help spread the heat. Check out those videos as well as a detailed written guide on my website all linked down below. So what is this modification that I'm talking about? How do we move this antenna out of the way? Where do we move it to? The chassis of the laptop functions as a Faraday cage, blocking all radio waves unless you have an opening. By default, there's an opening right here for the radio waves to escape. That's how the Wi-Fi antenna has signal. So we need to find somewhere else in this laptop that has an opening where the radio waves can escape. One of those places is the speaker vent right here. So hopefully we can put the antenna right there and uh, have it still work. Of course, this is too big to fit right here, so I got an off-the-shelf antenna that we'll be installing right around here. It comes in a pair because there's a main antenna and an auxiliary antenna. We're replacing the main antenna, so I just split this in half. So we only get this one, and we got a lead right here, and this little plug that goes into the socket on our Wi-Fi card. The reason I chose to route this wire over here is because I didn't want to 
you know, have it just lying around here and block the airflow across the heat sink as we've demonstrated earlier. One thing we have to be careful of is to avoid any of these clips that are used for closing the bottom lid. So I have to move this just a little bit out of the way. There is exposed metal right here that could potentially make a short with the bottom cover. So let's just insulate that. All right, this is looking really messy right now. I'm probably gonna try to improve it in the future, but right now, this is just a proof of concept. Can we move the Wi-Fi antenna somewhere else? Let's close this up and test our Wi-Fi and find out. So the signal strength before and after the antenna swap is about the same, and the time it takes to download a large file from my router actually improved, except for when my laptop was facing the wall. This means we can go ahead and mod this laptop without damaging one of those things that make it a laptop in the first place. Just a quick correction, my friend Larry pointed out that I oriented the antenna wrong. The PCB part should be toward the outside instead of the metallic part. After fixing it, the signal quality had no significant change, but I'm just warning you some of the following footage contain the earlier improper antenna orientation. Alright, let's go make some stuff. Here I'm using the bandsaw to cut out a Finstack heatsink that would go into the space where the antenna used to be. Not the finest cut, but it'll do the job. We do have a small problem though. The cutting has bent the fins in the direction of cut. So we're gonna have to clean this up so that the airflow doesn't get restricted. Fins have curled up a little bit at the edges, so I'm just gonna unfurl them downward. Okay, great. We'll run heat pipes from the CPU area to our new heatsink, but this ceiling strip is in the way, so we'll just peel it off. We also need to snip off this one clip on the fan that's poking at the heat pipes. Now, the heat pipes can run without obstructions. With some tissue laid down to protect the surface, let's pry off the antenna that we don't need anymore. I cut off this bridge looking thing that's part of the chassis, to clear the path for both airflow and the heat pipes. I filed out the rough edges here and vacuumed the dust. The fin stack fits snug in the spot where the antenna used to be. To make a little bit more space for the heat sink, we're gonna snip this part out. We also need to peel away the spongy seal to make some extra height. This part is particularly hard to remove, but we do also need to get it out of the way. So I'm just gonna melt that down with a soldering iron. Right there. We also wanna use the fan cover itself as heat sink area. So I scanned the fan, put it in CAD, and traced out its shape to laser cut a copper version of it. Yep, this should work. Before we solder these copper parts together, we should roughen the surfaces to help the solder bond. I put low melting point solder paste onto the heat pipes and squished it down. I dabbed glue at the corners so that I could lift them out as one piece. It's important that they stay together and not slide around during soldering. I held the parts with my third lighter complexion hand and clamped the parts together. Big thanks to my friend Thomas for helping me out. I had to crank the hot air gun's heat all the way up because these heat pipes are too good at dissipating that heat. I added some more solder paste and continued to solder. 
Now that the heat pipes have bonded with the fan cover, I added solder paste to the tips where it needed to attach to the fin stack. Because I had trouble getting the glue to keep them together, I made a sketchy move and started the heating process inside the laptop until the joint was strong enough for me to take it out and continue. Don't try this at home. The last solder joint was between the heat pipes and the CPU area of the main heatsink. I tried my best to give it enough pressure to help the solder bond the parts. As you have seen, I suck at soldering these large surfaces and made a mess. To fix that, I sanded away the excess solder. This time I realized it's easier to route the antenna wire down here. Check the fit of the whole modified heatsink and time to reapply thermal paste and put it back together. You can see our new heat sink and heat pipes right there. It's pretty tight, but it just about fits. There's a gap right here and here, and as you can see, there's some air escaping through them, which means that hot exhaust air is recirculating back into the laptop. The easiest way to prevent that is simply by applying some seal over this area to just seal off those gaps. And this is graphite sheet that I'm using here, which could also help transfer the heat from this area to right here. Welcome back. It is now winter. I apologize for the significant time jump as I finally have the opportunity to wrap up this project. To keep things fair, I've cranked up my heater, as you can probably hear right now, to replicate the same ambient temperatures. We're actually a little bit warmer, 20, 25, 26 degrees Celsius in this room right now, um, so that we can go back and do the same tests and see if our performance has increased at all. We've had Prime 95 running for more than 10 minutes now, and the package power has stabilized to about 24 watts as opposed to 20 watts before we did the mods. The CPU frequency is now between 2.5 and 2.6 gigahertz. So this is with the system keeping itself at 90 degrees. Um, so we're keeping the temperature factor constant and seeing how the power factor changes. Now we're gonna swap it around and keep power constant at the original 20 watts and see what the temperature becomes. So as you can see here, we're getting um, around 84, 85 degrees. So what we're seeing here is that when we allow the CPU to run at the same temperature as before, we get a four watt power increase or 20%. And when we peg the CPU at the same power as before, 20 watts, we get a temperature drop of about five degrees. So from 90 degrees to 85 degrees. Now that we're able to sustain 200 megahertz higher frequency under load, let's see how that affects our benchmark scores. The modified matebook maintains a lead that widens to 50 points as we approach steady state. This means our computer is now not only faster overall, but also less prone to performance degradation as a heavy work session goes on. To put that into perspective, here are all of the 8565U laptops that Notebook Check has reviewed running the same Cinebench loop that we did. As you can see, the scores are all over the place, from the low 400s to over 800. That's what I meant when I said these chips are extremely scalable to cooling capacity and throttling policies. After installing the second heatsink, our first run score was 819 points, which puts us at first place among these laptops, just beating out this 15-inch Zenbook right here. After cooking for a bit, our score settled to about 670 points, which is again neck and neck with these 15-inch frontrunners. So I was being very literal when I said we were going to make this little matebook as fast as a much bigger laptop. A lot of our success is still because of disabling power limits and those earlier mods I talked about. Although the second heatsink did give us that extra nudge we needed to top this chart, it did not give us as big a performance boost as I was hoping for. After having completed the project, I now understand why. First of all, it was very tricky to solder the copper well. So the thermal connections between the original heatsink, the heat pipes, and the added heatsink are far from perfect. Secondly, because of the arrangement of the heat pipes, not all of the fin stack is directly covered by them. So some portions of the fin stack are cooler than we'd like. We need the fin stack to be hotter than the exhaust air that's already in the laptop for it to do something other than just block airflow. This may not be true for all the fins. Nevertheless, I finally decided to share all of this with you anyway 
just in case you find it interesting or informative. I hope you learned something from this video, and I hope you'll stick around, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, visit my website bradshacks.com for more detailed written content, and follow me on Twitter for the latest behind the scenes updates, because there are more projects coming up and they'll continue to get better. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.